Okay. Star death. Yay. All right. We're, we got to zoom through this. Stars are born. They also die. They live their lives, right? The manner in which the star dies is dependent on its size, its type, as well as its position in space relative to other things. A G-type will have a very different end of life than a hypergiant or a red dwarf. Okay? The way that stars die, I think that there's this kind of common, quote-unquote, knowledge thing of that all stars just explode. People are always talking about, oh, the sun's going to explode. No, it's not. We'll talk about what it will do. And they're like, well, how do we know that? Well, because we can see other stars that are exactly like the sun, and we can see what they do when they die. OK? It is covered in a Kurtzkazak. If you want to watch the Kurtzkazak, then you can. Is their animation better than my slides? Yes. Is the voice better than my voice? Yes. But it's not the Kroshocracy. I run this class. OK. And I, want, and I want to be the center of your attention for at least the next 40 minutes, all right? So, or not 30 minutes, all right. So when we talk about how stars can end their life, they can end up being a supernova, which can lead to pulsars, neutron stars, well, okay, sorry, black holes, neutron stars. Pulsars are a type of um, neutron star. Can end in a planetary nebula, which will lead to a white dwarf. We can just have a burnout situation where it just fizzles out. Or we can have other catastrophic deaths like impacts or tidal ripping. Okay. We're going to talk more specifically about these two, supernova and planetary nebula. And what that means and um, what it means for us as a species and so forth. Okay. All right. So let's let's carry on here. We got to be pretty quick. Supernova. The plural of a supernova is supernovae or supernovae. Supernova is the explosion of a massive star when it can no longer maintain the equilibrium between fusion energy pushing out and gravity pulling in. The core ends up being crushed by gravity. The shock wave from the core collapse rips into the remnants of the star and creates a fusion event throughout the rest of the star. So generally, stars just make energy in their very center core, actually a pretty small area of the star. And the, the fusion energy is enough to push out and keep the star in equilibrium. What happens, though, is very massive stars have enough energy very massive stars have enough energy to start fusing heavier and heavier elements. So our sun fuses hydrogen into helium and a little bit of helium into lithium and beryllium. Okay? I want you to look up the, the periodic table of elements. This is actually important on here. So hydrogen is atomic number one. So that means it's just a single proton. Hydrogen finds another hydrogen and fuses to make atomic number two, that is helium. A helium finds another helium and they fuse and they become beryllium, or a helium finds a hydrogen and becomes lithium, okay? That's what happens in our star. Our star has enough mass to, to burn hydrogen and helium. That's essentially it. So it can make itself some lithium, a little bit of beryllium, and that's all. But ma more massive stars have more pressure, and they're able to push together larger atoms. So we end up with things fusing sodium, things fusing carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and it has enough energy to start fusing all the way down to lead, which is Pb on the 
um, periodic table, which is atomic number 82. These stars have enough mass and enough power to, to push together very large atoms. When lead begins to fuse, that is the end of the star. So these smaller atoms, when they fuse, they actually release quite a bit of energy. Um, well, a lot of energy, right? That's a new thermonuclear bomb, right? These small atoms, but as the, the atoms get larger, they take more energy to fuse together and they release less energy. And what happens is that once lead starts fusing, lead actually takes more energy out of the star than it puts back in. It takes more gravitational push in on the core to fuse lead than it pushes back out on the gravity. And so the core collapses. The core of the star collapses, and when it collapses, so there's a little, there's kind of a V-shape of graph of the amount of energy that is released when, when uh, certain elements are fused. Light elements release a lot of energy, don't take a lot of energy to fuse. And then lead is the very bottom of that V, and then once you start going up from lead, lead is actually the most stable element in the universe. <laughs> It just wants to be lead. lead. Lead is happy where it's at, okay? Well, okay, stable in terms of the, the fusion energy. It has the lowest fusion energy release. When the core collapses, there's a shock wave and the rest of the star, this is crazy guys, the star can go from several solar radii wide down to about the size of the Earth in a few seconds. Okay? Some, some of the exterior layers of the star collapse so fast because of the gravity, and then they all get pushed together very quickly. And the entire the entirety of the star experiences a fusion event all at once. So the outer layers of hydrogen get pulled in and they fuse in helium and all of that energy is released all at the same time. This, these explosions release more energy in a fraction of a second than our star will release over its entire lifetime. Okay, and this picture is a real image. This is a galaxy, a distant galaxy. And this looks like a star that has been caught in the image that's in our galaxy, right? So it's like you have a star and then in the distance there's a galaxy behind it. No, this is actually a star that was on the outskirts of this galaxy exploding. And it is brighter than the entirety of the rest of the galaxy. Now, who would that picture be outside of galaxies? What? Looking out. We can't look in. This isn't in the Milky Way. This is not our galaxy. This is a different galaxy. And this is a star that has just exploded um, in, in that galaxy. Okay. Ramses. So if it gets hit by it, so if a star close to us goes supernova, it would be a bad day for us. Thankfully, there are no stars large enough to go supernova in an area that would destroy us. We could get some serious radiation from a supernova explosion. For instance, like when Betelgeuse goes, we could get some serious radiation from that and that would be a bad day. But if stars explode, even, even planets outside of that star system can be ripped apart by the explosion, depending on how far you are away from the explosion. No, tidal ripping, ripping is due to gravity, and we'll talk about that 
um, that would be, that's not for these stars, that we're talking about star death. That would just be getting blown up by a distant supernova. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get, we'll get to neutron stars. Okay. So we just talked about this. The energy of a supernova can be 10 to the 44th power joules. I know that may, number doesn't mean anything to you, but remember, it is more the energy than the sun will release over 10 billion years, released in a fraction of a second. And the sun is no like a wimp, right? The sun is several million hydro, high, oh my goodness, thermonuclear weapons, okay? Several million thermonuclear weapons exploding every second. And this, you take all that energy, multiply it by 10 billion years, and this is more powerful in a fraction of a second. It's crazy. It's just, it's mind-blowingly huge. All right. So the, the sun makes 3.8 times 10 to the 26 joules of second per energy, per, of energy per second. There we go. Light bulb uses 600 joules per minute. Atomic bomb releases 4.2 times 10 to the ninth joules. Humanity uses an estimated 5, point, 5 times 10 to the 20th joules per year. A supernova releases that many joules. That's 10 with 44 zeros. <laughs> okay? The supernova releases... So if we release 5 times 10 to the 20th joules per year, it would take us something like... How, how many... Uh, let's see here, how many zeros, let's see here, nine, that's, that's a million, no, a million is six, billion, okay, let me think about it, nine billion, 12 trillion, 15 quadrillion, 18 quintillion, uh, 21, Sextillion twenty-four octillion. So it would take it would take humanity two octillion years to use the amount of energy of a supernova. <laughs> yes. How many universe lifetimes? How many universe lifetimes up till now? Um, a lot. 14 billion, uh, let me th just think about it for a second. That would be, we would need to add uh, 15 zeros. So it would be two quadrillion, something like that. Two quadrillion universe lifetimes. What? Yes. <laughs> so it would just take a very long time, right? It, it, enough of a long time that you could just say it would take literally forever. Okay. All right. So let's let's carry on now that you have the, an understanding of how stupidly powerful a supernova is. A black hole or a neutron star can be the result of a supernova explosion. These are incredibly massive and strange objects. The determining factor of whether a supernova will leave a black hole or a neutron star is its mass. Okay? So there's a certain point at which a supernova will create a neutron star. And after that point, more mass, after that point, it becomes a black hole. Okay, so this is post supernova. So the star always leaves something behind after it dies. In this case, after a supernova, it can leave behind a neutron star or a black hole. Okay, I'm going to carry on.
If this is too fast for you, remember, go back and watch the YouTube videos. Neutron stars are the result of stars between 10 and 29 solar masses that explode. This is obviously not a real image. This is our best understanding of what a neutron star would look like. If you were this close to a neutron star, you'd be dead in a fraction of a second for many different reasons. <laughs> okay, they are small, but they are really dense. And when I say they're small, they're about the same size as a city. Okay, so a neutron star would actually fit inside of this valley. We just don't know. Okay. However, it has the same amount of mass as the entire sun. So if <laughs> the Earth would very quickly rip and then wrap around it and become part of it. Well, no, it would like go because everywhere would all be attracted to the same point at the same time. So it'd be like the sides would try to get there first, and it would, it would yeah, it would be bad. Just go. <laughs> it would just be very bad. Okay. So okay. Um, has anyone read the book What If by Randall Monroe? Okay. If you have not read that book and you want a good, entertaining, scientific time, check out What If by Randall Monroe. He's a former NASA engineer who creates comics. And he took some questions from web listeners. Um, and he, uh, what's his name again? Randall Monroe. It's uh, Mr. Pro or Nice. I have a copy. Um, I know that several of the teachers here have a copy of it. <laughs> Randall, and his last name is Monroe, so M-U-N-R-U-E, or R-O-E, M-U-N-R-O-E, okay? He was submitted a question, if you could make a bullet out of a neutron star, okay? If you could make a bullet out of the stuff that a neutron star is made out of, what would the properties of that star or of that bullet be? That bullet would weigh as much as the Empire State Building, and it would have a serious gravitational pull. If you got within a meter of this and reached your hand out, all of the blood in your, in your body would flow into your hand because of the gravity, and then eventually it would actually start seeping through your pores because it would be so strong. You'd have to like tie yourself down, by the way. You'd be pulled very quickly toward it. Um, pretty crazy. Also, if you dropped it, it would fall through the earth. Okay? It is so dense that it would just go straight through the cement. So is that a bullet's worth of a neutron star or is that a neutron star? No, it is, it is the neutron star stuff. You took a small piece of a neutron star and made it into a bullet. It's just as dense. It's just as dense as a neutron star, but it's the size of a bullet. Okay? It would have insane properties. Crazy, insane properties. Okay? Um, I am not going to make you. I am not going to make you do this right now because we do not have time. Okay. We need to talk about black holes. We will come back to neutron stars and specifically pulsars probably next time. Black holes, stars that have masses of. 30 or more solar masses will go supernova and then create a black hole. If, you're, if you tried to stand on a neutron star, by the way, 
I mean, heat and radiation aside, which they're very hot and very radioactive, all that aside, which would kill you, if you could survive the heat and radiation, you would be instantly killed because your atoms would be spread out over the surface of this, of this uh, neutron star like butter over toast. Space just by standing there. The gravity would squish you so thoroughly without anything falling on you, just the gravity of your own body. The gravity would squish you so thoroughly that you wouldn't even be organic molecules anymore. You would be stretched into atoms across the surface of this. Yeah. Like if you stood next to one, would you be roasted? Heat in space is a weird thing. <laughs> so heat in space is a weird thing. Black holes can generate a lot of heat and energy, but they don't do it in like the way, same way that the sun does it. <laughs> what if you had like a little oxygen tank and you were standing there next to the black hole? <laughs> if you had a room with a black hole, and some oxygen and you in it? No, the black hole's outside. Uh, yeah, you could, it could get hot. So what does the black hole emit this heat? It, the black hole itself is not generating heat. It's the spinning crap around. It's the disk around the black hole that is heated as it falls in. Okay, and that's what this is here. And uh, the, the image of the black hole, the actual image above my board here, is showing that exact phenomenon. Okay? Um, What's the blue stuff going into it? That's actually coming out of it. What? This is a, this is a radiation jet. It's not nothing coming out of black holes. Um, no, it doesn't come out of here. It comes out of right here. Just, just, just outside of the event horizon. So we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So we're not going to do the research. I'm just going to tell you about it. Okay. Black holes, and here is the the first image ever captured of a black hole. Is that that fuzzy? Yes, it is that fuzzy, and that, and it took a telescope the size of the entire Earth to get this picture. Okay. So black holes have some really strange properties. We've talked about time dilation at the beginning of this class, right? That when you are near a black hole, time passes significantly slower for you than someone who is here on Earth. Right? Travel works. <laughs> yes. Its effects on space time is that Space and time are like two halves of the same coin, right? Space is the stuff around us. It is the, it is the... Space is the everything. I kind of like to think of space as the canvas and every, everything matter, like all, all the, the matter in the universe is the paint on the canvas. Without the canvas, the matter cannot exist. Without the canvas, the paint cannot exist. Does that make sense? Yeah. We think of the universe as a painting. Space is the canvas. The matter is the paint. Okay? Black holes bend the space. Black holes bend the space so thoroughly that it actually becomes an infinite hole in space time. They say screw all that. Yes. Yes. I would love to see the space. <laughs> you would love to see the what? The oh, the page. <laughs> So yes, the, so when we talk about um, space time, oftentimes they, it's kind of, kind of compared to a trampoline that you put like a bowling ball in the middle and the bowling ball makes a curve in the trampoline, right? Things with matter, things with mass make curves in space time. The earth makes a curve in space time, the sun makes a curve in space time, and the Earth is actually traveling in a straight line along a curved path around the Earth, or around the Sun. The Earth orbits the Sun not because 
it has a force exerted on it, but because space time is literally curved. So if you are on a, in, a, in a car driving on a road, there are two ways to turn that car, the direction of the car. There's literally turn the car and exert a force, exert a force sideways, or you can drive on a curved road that bends a certain direction. You don't have to turn the, the steering wheel at all. It just takes you that way. We are on a curved space time traveling in a straight line. Okay? Space time. The black hole, the black hole curves space time infinitely. Yes, Kevin. What black holes by their existence just say screw it all the time and space? Time and space stop existing at the center of a black hole. And so we'll talk about that in a second. Dark matter to space no, no, no. Dark matter? No, no, no. I said the dark matter too. Oh, okay. Kind of. But we understand black holes better than we understand black dark matter. What? Uh, so, what if there were two black holes and they were going at each other and they glanced off of each other? What happens? Could you like, make them not black holes again? No, so black holes don't glance off of each other because they, there's nothing to glance. There's nothing to hit. They are an infinitely dense point. So when black holes merge, those two points become one. But they don't actually hit each other. There's no like physical contact. Does that make sense? So, the spaghettification, this here, this is one of my favorite words in all of science, in all of anything, really. Spaghettification is the force of when you, so I want you to close your eyes. I know this is cheesy, but I want you to close your eyes and imagine falling feet first toward a black hole. Oh, God. Okay, try not to panic. As you fall feet first toward the black hole, your feet start ex experiencing more gravity than your head. Because the, your feet are closer to a very massive object than your head is. Because they start experiencing a stronger gravity, they start accelerating faster than your head is accelerating. Your feet are then ripped off your body and your legs are ripped off, and then your torso is, is, so what happens is the closer you get, the stronger the gravity is. You can open your eyes now. You are now a string of atoms falling into a black hole. The atoms that used to be in your feet falling the fastest toward the black hole, and your, the string of the atoms that used to be in your head falling slightly slower. That's a whole different kind of And so we go from an object that's like this, as it's falling, to an object that is like that, as it's falling. Spaghettification. That's a whole different kind of string theory. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please don't throw that out. OK, so gravitational lensing, um, we can talk about this more later. Um, Black holes make light bend. And so when we, the most accurate depiction of what a black hole would look like close up is in film version is from Interstellar. Hold on, I got No. Um, Honestly, I think that it looks like a two-dimensional, infinitely black spot from every angle. So this is what a black hole would look like if you were to look at it edge on to the accretion disk. So this is the accretion disk, and this above it is actually that same accretion disk but the light is going up and over the black hole and then coming to your eyes. 
and being bent toward your eyes. So what you see here is, actual, is actually there. What you see here is not there. It is behind the black hole. You are seeing behind the black hole the light from the accretion disk, and this is the same thing. This is the underside of this same disk that is actually hidden behind the black hole, but you can see it because the light is going like this, up and around. Okay? Isn't that trippy? This is trippy. It, it, looks, it looks like it's there, right? We're just so accustomed to our eyes telling us where things are. But just like, with, just like with water, if you try and hunt a catfish with a... So my father-in-law, this is the best story that I've heard about him in the past few weeks. Before he died, we were talking about all these stories. He was hunting catfish in a ditch with a pitchfork. <laughs> and they, they were... He was like 10, and they were getting these catfish. And... He went to stab a catfish and he lifts up the pitchfork and there is pitchfork, catfish, foot, and then end of the spine of the catfish. So he went through the catfish and then went through his foot. Um, but at least he got the catfish, right? But the problem is that the light is bent by the water, right? So you when you try and see things in water, they're actually not where you think they are. Yes, this is problem. even, this is an even more accentuated example of that, that not only is light bent like at a little bit of an angle, it is literally bent in a circle. So basically this is bent at everything. Yes. Okay. Last thing. The event horizon. Does anyone know what the event horizon is? Yeah. Yes. Yes, Reepy, Reepy has it spot on. The event horizon is, is the thing that we see as the black hole. The actual black hole is hidden behind the, the event horizon. The event horizon is the point at which the escape velocity, the amount of velocity that you need to escape from the black hole, the gravity becomes so strong that the escape velocity is above the speed of light. What? So nothing can escape beyond that point. Therefore, we see it as completely black. Okay? So the actual black hole is not this black thing. This black thing is the event horizon of the black hole. The black hole is a speck inside of that of infinitely dense matter. Yes. So, so basically, it turns matter to a singular parts and then turns that into energy. And then, some, what does it do with the energy? That, what does it turn the energy into? So, it doesn't create energy. Um, it does make radiation, but we can talk about that another time. So in review, that was a lot of information today. Hopefully you got it all. In review, we live in the solar system in the Orion arm, or sorry, Orion spur in the Sagittarius arm of the Milky Way, which is in the local group in the Virgo cluster in the Lani Akea supercluster of the observable universe. And we talked about supernova explosions, neutron stars, and black holes. We will cover the rest of the information you will need for the exam on what, Monday? Yes, on Monday. Do we have school on Monday? Yes. Monday. I will see you all then. Bye, bye, bye.